What do you think is the influence of colleges and how do you feel about the current educational system, period? I think universities are making seven fatal errors. Apparently, it seems to be fine if a woman wants to play a patriarchal role, that seems to be perfectly fine. It's corrupt, but it's okay if women occupy the positions of power. It's like, okay. What do you not know a lot about that if asked about, you don't really have that strong of an opinion or research on those topics? You have a moral duty to supersede the accomplishments of the person who bore that name and gave it its weight before you dare capitalize on it in the public sphere. And there's, Trudeau did none of that. Right? We're never gonna see Prime Minister Jordan Peterson. That's not, that's not in the equation. Um, so look, we get a lot of guests on Valuetainment, but one of the most highly requested guests ever by you on Valuetainment has been Dr. Jordan Peterson, clinical psychologist, professor at the University of Toronto, as well as the author of 12 Rules for Life. Dr. Jordan Peterson, thanks for joining us you here bet. with Valuetainment. Thanks so, for the invitation. Yes, definitely. It's good to have you here. You know, this... If you, if you don't know Dr. Jordan Peterson, if you, you know, I, I would say total views, because I've seen some of your views, 50 million on Facebook, 80 million, some stuff has gone completely viral. I'd say total a billion views, give or take, maybe even more than that with your content that's on YouTube, Facebook, all over the place. People now know the name Dr. Jordan Peterson. And the part I want to spend some time uh, talking to you about today is a couple things. One, obviously a lot of people who interview you, they're going to talk to you about politics, religion, God postmodernism, all of these things, and maybe we'll get into some of that stuff, but what I'm very curious about with you is the following. One is who Jordan Peterson was growing up, right? I mean, you read the stories about at 13 years old, you were given a book and you started studying some of, I think, Ayn Rand, George Orwell, and some of these books that were given to you, and then from there, you have other inspirations that came up, and I think at one point at Harvard, you were studying drugs and alcohol and the addiction reasoning, why do we get addicted, and then you become who you become, and you have some strong opinions. But I want to know who you were in high school. If I was in high school today with you, we're in 10th grade. We're classmates. I'm sitting next to you. We're good friends. Who's Jordan Peterson? Um, well, first, I'm not very tall. So I was younger than most of the people in my class because I skipped grade one. Okay. And so I, I was five foot two in grade 10. Really? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, I suppose that made me a little bit more agile verbally than I might have otherwise been. Most of my friends were working class guys. Most of them quit school in junior high and, and early in high school. Most of the friends that I had in high school were very comical people. I had four very close friends from a little tiny town even north of where I grew up and there was almost nothing north of where I grew up. Uh, they were extremely comical people and so we told jokes to each other all the time, tried to amuse each other. I spent a lot of time driving around on the country, listening to music, drinking beer with my friends out in the bush. In high school? Yeah. That's great. So well, beer, beer yeah. helps to think the way you think right now, I guess. That's <laughs> well, the recipe. It's a long winters in northern Alberta, you know, and not, not a tremendous amount to do. And, well, it's a, not atypical teenage behavior. That was me in high school. I read all the time. I oh, you did? So you yeah, were reading yeah. all the time? Yeah, yeah. I read a book a day for years. Are you kidding me? No, most of it was science fiction. I had a neighbor across the street who had a huge science fiction collection, a whole wall, and he used to let me come in there once a week or so, and I'd pick like seven or eight books and take them home and read them, and then I'd come back and get another eight. I read science fiction like that, oh, I don't know. From what age? Oh, 10, probably. One a day? Yeah, yeah, that was my that wow. was my goal. Now, are you a speed reader? Do you go through it? I'm a very fast reader. Were you always fast back then as well? Yeah, or? I learned to read when I was very young. My father taught me to read when I was very young, and uh, I'm I'm very fast. Did he teach you how to fast read, or were you just you just started reading? So that was something I was very yeah. Well, to I, I wouldn't say specifically he taught me to speed read. Um, he just taught me to read, and I guess I'm happen to be relatively fast at it. So it it. Um, that's been a very useful thing for me. So your dad had a big influence on you. Your yeah. father had a big influence yeah, yeah. on he the spent reading a lot aspect. Of, oh, you bet. He spent a lot of time with me when I was a little kid. You know, yeah. we used to, I used, he used to come home every night. We'd spend an hour or so reading. He had designed this. He was a teacher. He had a workbook, which I still have, that, that outlined all the phonics, the, the, um, in, how, all the sounds of all the letters, the sounds of all the two-letter combinations, and all of that. And we went over that every night. And, and I, th that happened for a long time, from the time I was probably three onward, I think. At three years old? <clears throat> yeah, Now, very what young. did your mom do? My mom, well, when, when I was a kid, she took care of us. She stayed home. When, she was trained as a nurse. She never practiced as a nurse, though. 
Uh, she had kids, and then later she became librarian for our local college, and she had a career that lasted about 20 years as a head librarian. And she was a very, is, both my parents are still alive. She's a very pleasant person, very funny. She has a great sense of humor. I used to make her laugh all the time, so that was, and I still do, sometimes on purpose, sometimes accidentally. <laughs> yeah. And so humor, was, did humor, has humor always been part of your MO? Like, have you always been somebody that oh, told yeah. jokes? Yeah, definitely. Well, it was a big part of the culture in Northern Alberta. Like, it was a big deal if you were funny. I have partied music. with a lot of Canadians, and, and mm -hmm. we drank a lot of coconut. And I, these guys are funny people. Yeah. I mean, they know how to have fun. Yeah, well, there's a lot of Canadian comedians, eh? I mean, yeah, that's we, right. we export yeah. them down to the States so that you guys have something to I mean, laugh about. We need about. your help because we mm -hmm. need some good comedians down mm -hmm. here, right? So. But you better be funny if you're going to live through a Canadian winter. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. You definitely you better need amuse. It. You better be amusing. And yeah. so, yeah, it was an important thing. Like a lot of what we did when when we were kids, when we were adolescents in particular, was just try to sit around and amuse each other. You know, with your dad, witty, what? sarcastic comments. I grew mostly. up in the. I was in the military, so this is very normal for us. We right. like witty. We like sarcasm. Some people have a hard time with that, but it's yeah. a, it's a. Uh, uh, I think it's more of a working class thing. You know. I think so as well. That's yeah, and a good I really point. miss it. I really like it because as I sort of moved up the ranks, yeah. let's say um, on the academic front, that became less and less common. You get your wit from that side, or you think that's part of a DNA? You were born being witty, or because you were in an environment that you had to be witty that made you survive? So the person. Oh yeah, that was tell definitely part joke. of it. Well, it was also because I was was small and and mouthy. It was very useful to be sarcastic and witty too because it was the only defense that I that's had a, really. That's a good so, point. So you know people would come after me. I mean everybody gets, there's lots of physical yeah, of back course. and forth in junior high and high school but um, people would come after me and I could defend myself reasonably well with my tongue so. I think Ben Shapiro has a similar story as well. Yeah. He's a similar guy as well yeah. because he was a year ahead I think it's a year you know and he, had, he was always smaller so he had yeah. to figure out a way to stand up and he was being bullied. I don't think yeah, you're don't saying bully, though, Don't mess with Shapiro, right? man. No, no, his brain is oh, also... Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, he's the fast. The way he is, it's... Yeah. It's, uh, it's quite impressive. I've yes, watched him is. lots of times on YouTube. Yeah. You, you want to mess with him at your peril. Yeah, we've had him on Valley before, and the way he thinks is also very interesting how we uh, process this issue. So let me ask you, when you said your dad was teaching you how to read from three years old, and he's going through it, and then all of a sudden you pick up and start reading a book a day, would you also have dialogues with your dad? Hey, dad, what do you think about this? Hey. No, I wouldn't say not okay, so much. That's no, dad's quite introverted. And, really? Uh, yeah. So there yeah. wasn't a debate type of a format. No. Your, so no. your family wasn't. I can't believe Prime Minister. No, did no, this. no, very little. Interesting. Very little. Dad figured he would have been happier if he would have been born a hundred years earlier. I mean, he grew up in a log cabin. He grew up, literally, and he grew up on this this. Well, my my grandparents were the original homesteaders in Saskatchewan. Canada, Western mm -hmm. Canada is about 100 years behind the Western US. It's a beautiful US. area, by the way. That whole area, they've got some nice properties. Yes, yes. And, and so, and his parents were from, his parents were of Norwegian extraction and they built a log cabin in the middle of the damn prairie and that's where he grew up. And, you know, he's a hunter and a trapper and a fisherman and he likes to be outside. He likes to spend time alone, although he's got close friends, but these are people that he mostly does these, you know, this hunting and fishing with. That's, I mean, he was a teacher. He was the fire chief in our local town. He ran a huge or huge fish and game association, imported elk to northern Alberta. There mm. were no elk up there before before the organization brought them up there. And so, but that was his life. And he's a gunsmith and a gun collector. And he has like, I don't know how many guns, many, many. And so that's his culture and his life. And, and it was never something that I was really part of. I mean, I went hunting with him. I went fishing and trapping with him. We used to camp all the time when I was a kid. We weren't a particularly political family or a, a philosophically oriented family for that matter. I mean, my dad's very smart. And Philosophically oriented yeah, family, not you were not. No, no, was it I a religious so. family? Was it a church no, home family? Not really, was it let's read really. the Bible every day, let's pray? Oh, no, 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 definitely not. Really? Definitely not. So, I where mean, did the debate come from? Where, where did your ability to be able to listen, process, respond, where did that ability come from? Was it when you went into academia? Is it, is it post? Yeah, probably. I, I think to some degree it's, it's, it's a natural ability. I mean, even when I was a graduate student, when I was first teaching, I, I seemed to be good at it, my, the classes that I taught as a graduate student, and that was without any previous teaching experience, were popular. And then, I, well, now I've been teaching, I've been lecturing for, you know, multiple times a week for 30 years, and so, and I also very seldom relied on notes. I mean, I, to begin with, when you don't know a topic very well, you have to scaffold the conversation with notes. No, but I, I always very loosely stuck to my notes. I would prepare a lot beforehand, but then so I always try. So you're not a power, if I come, you're not going to give a PowerPoint speech, here's what we're doing. 
Right. You're just going to speak and right. talk and when about I, You know, when PowerPoint first came out, I used it more, uh, I relied on it more than I did once I got accustomed to it. But no, it's better to, it's better to sketch out your, your talk and then rely on your notes as little as possible if you can manage it. I learned to do that, and I like I practiced doing that so that I could get to the point where how, I could how speak extemporaneously. That? How do you practice that? You just try to stay farther and farther away from your notes as you as you oh, develop lectures. Oh, I see what lectures. you're saying. Yeah. So well, you, there's, I'm there's, saying, do you role play? Do you sit there with the notes no, first and then you set it no, aside? No, 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 no. Okay. Usually, what I do that that's a good question. I mean, first of all, I I try to be over prepared in some sense. So, I mean, I believe that if you're going to if you're going to give a 20 minute lecture, you should have an hour of material at hand because that way you have an opportunity to sort of move spontaneously through the material. But generally what I do now, because I have a lot of material at hand, a lot of stories and a lot of things that I've, a knowledge say, that I've accrued over the years, usually before a lecture, I'll, and this is the hard part, and I can do a lecture without doing this, but it's better if I do this, this is the hard part. Mm -hmm. I'll sit down for 20 minutes with my eyes closed, and I figure out what the, what the central topic is, so there's always a question. What's the question I'm trying to address in this lecture? And then I'll figure out a pathway through it. It's like, okay, well, here's the argument. Here's point one, here's point two, here's point three, and there's possible branches off those. And then with each point, I usually have a collection of stories and facts that I can use to make the point. Validate so, the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and to buttress it and to make it interesting. And so it's a little bit, I, it's a little bit like imp improvisational jazz, I would say, or even improvisational piano, because I play a little bit of piano. And so you lay out the, the story, and then right. you can use the responses of the sure. audience to guide how you're going to walk through it. So Not duplicatable. You have to have that ability to do that. Do you, would you say you have some kind of a photographic memory a little bit, or no? No, 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 at no not at all. Not at all. So all these no. books, you are either kind that you can say page 73, no. second, no, okay, I don't so think like that. You. No, it's not. Okay, I know I've it. known people like right. that. Like, I, I had professors Because you were, seem like you may have a little bit of that, yeah. because the way you... No, I don't organize myself okay. that way. I knew professors at, at Harvard, one particular professor, Richard McNally, who was a walking library. Man, he... he he, he, extraordinarily well-read person, very, very smart, very fast on his feet. And that's really how he seemed to organize his knowledge. He would know the author, he would know the page, he'd know the source, he'd know where the book was that's on so his shelf. That's so interesting to me. I, but you, I'm not like that. Got it. I thought you were for sure no. some other. Okay, so let me... So I have a theory that I've been working on for a very long time, and what happens when I read something is I plug it into the theory. So I know the full outline of the theory. It's, it'd probably take me 45... 50 hours to lay it out in lectures. I've done that online. And then, but I keep, it grows and grows and grows and grows. And I Got know where it. to put everything. I, so if I read something, I think, oh yes, that slot's there. And so. And so you store it as well. If somebody asks yeah. you a question, you need to use that fact. You have it somewhere stored where you bring yeah. it and say, okay. But it has to be related to this work Topic. that I've been doing over time. Got yeah, it. yeah. Got so it. it's kind of like, there, there, there's this technique called a memory castle that people have used for centuries to remember things. And so what you do is you, 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 you sit and you, you imagine a, might be a place that you know, like a, lit, a geographic place, a house. And then you can place the things that you remember. Imagine you walk through the house. You can place the things that you want to remember at different locations in the house. Mm -hmm. But you have, to, you have to turn what you're remembering into an image. And then you can walk through the house and, and you can lift things up and find what it is that you're trying to remember. I sort of do that with this theory. It's like it's, it's been, I, I've literally worked on it for, it's been 40 years. And so I know, the, I know the story and I know its branches and I keep adding to it and adding to it and shifting pieces around from time to time. And so that's how I remember things. And I forget a lot of what I read, a tremendous amount of what I read. That's but now and then something pops up and it sticks. You know? That changes the complete perspective for me a little bit, for me to know that your uh, views obviously has been vested for many years, but you're also constantly working on it. I guess this leads to me uh, wanting to ask this question from you is, I think from my opinion, I think I run a business here, I'm an entrepreneur, we do what we do with Valuetainment. I believe the people that make it to the top of any space, they learn how to process issues better than others. They learn how to put things together, a system that helps them make a good decision, and then from there they come out with their opinion, maybe based on some facts, based on whatever they collect together, data, to say this is what I believe about God, this is what I believe about politics, here's how I view economics, this is what I think works, this is what I think is the way we ought to live, the 12 rules for life, right? Here's what I think boys need to do, or women, or men, or this is based on this. What do you do? What is your processing when a topic enters your mind? How are you 
taking the next necessary step to come up with an answer or a belief that you're very comfortable saying, this is what I believe in. I know one of the questions you don't like to be asked is, do you believe in God? And your response is phenomenal because you said, one, I don't know what believe means to you and I don't know what God means to you because the word believe in God may be a different meaning to me. So that's a very interesting answer to give. But how do you process issues here when a new topic comes out to you? Kavanaugh comes out. Everybody goes through the issue with Kavanaugh, right? And you come out and, you know, afterwards, like, well, I think he needs to, you know. Well, I, I usually do think about it. I, but I want to know, like, what's the step? Is yeah, it a sure. step process? I'd love to hear that part. Sure. Well, I mostly, I can think in images. And so if I'm building things, because I like to do carpentry and fix houses and that sort of thing. And so I like to build things. And if I'm figuring out how to build something, I can picture it. And so I can think in pictures. But I don't usually think in pictures. I usually think in words. And I think pretty formally in words, like if I'm sitting down, let's say, with the Kavanaugh issue, there was a question, the question Eric Weinstein asked was, um, was there an alternative to him being confirmed or not confirmed? Mm -hmm. Because he sort of thought both of those wouldn't bode well for the country. And I thought, okay, well, what could the op option possibly be? So I think that through in words and then think, well, he could, well, I eventually thought, well, he could be um, nominated and then how would I feel in a situation like that? Well, my, my nomination would be very contentious. Is there a way that I could help dampen the contentiousness and still retain my, um, my reputation? I thought, well, you could be nominated and resign. What would be the advantages to that? And then I lay out one side of the argument, and then I lay out the other and another and another and, and have an argument. And like an in, inside. With yourself. Oh, absolutely. That's what you're oh, doing. Oh, absolutely. Got it. Yeah, basically what you do, and this is really what you do when you think, is... You, you know, if, if thinking is an internalized conversation, which at least is one form of thinking, is that you spin off avatars of yourself and you say, well, you take this position and you take this position and you take this position and then you have each fictional part of yourself lay out the argument and, and argue it through. So, for example, when I write, so that's another thing that I've done a lot of to prepare for my lectures, you know, I've written... Well, I've written two books, and one of them took 15 years. I wrote three hours a day for 15 years every day. That was the first book. That's Maps a technical book. It's a very technical book. Oh, yes, it's a very book. hard book, yes. that. So, so I, laid out, I laid out that argument. But the, the way I did it was, well, first of all, you generate your ideas. Okay. That's the first part. There's actually a technical process that goes along with this. I, I use a computer in a particular way. So imagine I've laid out an essay. Okay. Well, then what I'll do is I, I usually use two screens. I take a paragraph out. Mm -hmm. put it on the other screen, break it into sentences. Okay. So I put spaces between all the sentences. Got it. Then I look and see if the sentences are organized properly, if, that, if that's the proper order. Try to reconstruct them so that they, that, that, that they make more sense, they flow better. Then I take each sentence one at a time and try to write a better version of the sentence, maybe three or four times. And every time I try to write a better version of the sentence, I try to think of all the ways that sentence is wrong and could be fixed. So at the level of the word, at the level of the phrase, at the level that of the technical. sentence. That's technical. Oh, you bet. Like for Maps of Meaning, the first book, I probably wrote every sentence in that book 50 times. Are you kidding me? Oh, no, me? absolutely. And then, well, there's more. So then, so then I'll, I'll take, put the paragraph back together. And if it's better than the original paragraph, then I'll put it in. So then I have a replacement for it. But then also imagine it's a chapter. Well, then the chapter has a structure, so I'll outline the structure. So this is real helpful, too, if you're writing a chapter. It's like, well, uh, um, boil it down to 10 sentences. So you've boil written a chapter. chapter down to yeah, 10 sentences. Yeah, you've got a chapter, write a 10-sentence outline. And that forces you to condense what you wrote. And with 10 sentences, you can see the arguments. Does that argument make sense? Then you can cut and paste the paragraphs from the essay back into that structure. And if you do that three or four times, then you have a very, very tight argument. I have a writing guide on my website at jordanbpeterson.com under products. It's free. It's, it's, it's just a Word document, but it outlines how to do this. Imagine if you're writing. So here, here's what you have to get right if you're writing. The whole argument has to make sense as a whole. Okay. You can think rather unclearly and still make an argument that works as a whole. Sometimes I read essays written by intuitive students, and the essay works as a whole. Like, there's a good idea in mm -hmm. it, but it's very badly written. But there's an idea there. So it sort of succeeds at the highest level. But then, 
if, if something's written real well, it's every word is the right word. Every phrase is the right phrase. The phrases are put into sentences properly. The sentences are organized into paragraphs properly. And you have to edit at every one of That's those levels. That's why you said piano. So you're, it has mm. to be like if one, you know, pianist listen to another person play yeah. and one is off, they catch it, right? Yeah, a regular right. person's not going to catch it. Yeah. So you're, you're going to that level yeah. of perfection. Well, then I also read everything out loud. Do you seek perfection in that, in that area? No, but I, what I seek, I wouldn't say I seek perfection. What I seek is that I can't do it any better. So I know a book is done when Perfection I can't write to it your any ability. better. Yeah, that's right. I, I max my ability out. So if I can't, and if I if I'm at the point where when I'm starting to edit, I'm I'm not sure if it's better, then it's time to quit. Interesting. And I also often, if I'm writing, like I'll write something, and then wait. Like you have to wait a couple of weeks to look at it again because often when you're writing and you reread it, you read what you think you wrote. Because you're still, you still have the ideas in your head that, that are part of the cloud of ideas. And it's not until you forget the context, in some sense, that you can actually see what you wrote. And so there has to be pauses in your writing as well. Do you, do you have a method for turning off all the noise? I mean, you have a family, you have kids, so is there, and you, you have things oh, yeah, that you do. I so what is method. your method for turning oh, off all the oh, noise? I'm like a junkyard dog, man. It's like, don't come in and bother me when I'm writing. And like, it's been hard, somewhat hard on my family, particularly on my wife, because you know, like I said, I, I, from 1985 to, to 1999, I wrote three hours a day. And the rule was, don't bother me when I'm writing. Like, leave me alone. And the reason for that would be, you know, I'd, I'd be working on something. And I'd have like half an hour of thoughts in my head stacked up to make an argument. And then someone would interrupt me and I'd lose all of it. It's like, that's no good. And so I got, well, I have a mental image. It's like there's barbed wire it's a barbed wire junkyard, and, and I'm a junkyard dog. Do you ever lose it and it doesn't come back? Or you lose oh, it? Oh, definitely. Okay. Oh, for so sure. Are you a mad scientist type, or no? Yeah. So, okay. So you do get frustrated, get, you know, uh, upset. And you you have that side as well. Oh, definitely. Okay. So, do you get along with yourself typically? Like, uh, do you know, you know what I'm talking? When I say you get along with yourself, like, you know, sometimes I'm, you know, I enjoy driving. I enjoy my own company at times. Yeah. Like, I'm a guy that for me, therapy is going to the movies by myself at 10 o'clock in the morning. Tell my assistant, I got to do something. I come back with popcorn mm. all over my shirt. That to me is therapy. And believe it or not, I think in movies. Mm. But do you get along with Jordan Peterson yourself? Like, do you have battles internally when you're battling a topic or an issue or a theory? Oh, I have battles with myself all the time. That's what thinking is, you know, like... See, people think that thinking is you encounter something and thoughts appear in your head and those are your thoughts. It's like that's you're just barely getting started at that point because you have to take those thoughts and then you have to critically assess them. And that's really, that's where the thinking starts. And that's based on what? That's based on experiences, that's based on data, that's based on research, that's based on influence from a friend or a professor to that, say, John, what do you that. think about? What else would you, is it also based on the fact that you're not being lazy about the fact that you're willing to put the additional minutes that you get into a topic to so say, I'm going to read a little bit more about this topic. And then is there the idea with conflict? Would you say well, some of it of is some of it? And, and I also outlined this to some degree in this writing guide that I that I mentioned is like, well, the first question might be, well, why write or why make an argument? And the answer is, well, if you're writing to figure out what you think, then you're going to use what you think to guide your action. And the consequence of that is going to be how your life turns out. So I'm dead serious about what I write because, because I know what the pathway is. It's like you don't, you don't communicate in a false manner because if you do, you will warp the structure that guides your actions and you will absolutely, absolutely 100% suffer for that. I mean, one of the things I've learned as a clinical psychologist is that I've never seen anyone, it's really a terrifying thing, I've never seen anyone get away with anything, ever. It, the chickens always come home to roost. So, and sometimes it might, you know, let's say you get away with something. It's like, yeah, you think so, man. You wait five years from now, seven years from now, it'll come back. Is that and karma? It's more like, yes, I think it's the kind. same idea, but it's more like you, you can't, you, you, you don't have the power to manipulate reality. Like you have the power to bring about reality sure. in some sense because you confront potential and through your actions and, and, and your communicative intent, you turn potential into reality. But you don't have the, you don't have the power to bend reality without it snapping you don't back think at so. you. You don't think so. So you don't think visionaries and influencers have the ability to bend reality? No, I don't think they bend it. I, I think that they, 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 I mean, you can bring new things into being. 
but you can't you can't get away with a falsehood. Hmm. No, you can definitely bring new things of, into being. You can't get away with a falsehood. Yes, that's it. And Maybe so, okay, makes sense. And and you can't get away with weak thinking either, because I mean any more than you can get away with improper action. It just doesn't work. So you're you're contending. It's it's why I mean one of the themes in my writing is the danger of falsehood, in at any at every level. It's like well, if you tell the truth to the degree that you can, or at least don't lie. That I think that's rule eight. Um, then you have reality on your side. You got to decide, man. You want reality on your side, or do you want reality against you? Now, I wouldn't recommend the whole reality against you thing, because you're not going to win. You're going to get flattened. And so I'm very careful with what I say, and I'm very careful with what I write. Like I try to, if I write something down, it's not an opinion. Mm. I mean, obviously it is because it's my my thought. Sure. But it's. It's, I, I try to take those sentences and beat them to death. I'm trying only to leave on the paper things I cannot get under and flip over. So, and that's with every, literally, it's every sentence. Yeah, because it seems like for the most part, when somebody, when, you, when you're sitting with these interviews and people are asking you questions about whatever topic having to do with politics, it seems like you've recited that answer 50 times to somebody. You're like, da 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 And you're just kind of dancing with them. And like you know, say there's a series of a thousand questions, it's like a, an actor who's role played these things so much, except you're not the actor, you're a real life person that believes these things that you're reciting back to people because it's been stored here for a while. So it doesn't seem like anything's coming off the cuff. It seems like this has been already thought about and talked about for yeah, yourself. Yeah, I try not to answer questions that I haven't thought about. Well, here's a question for you. I mean, you've been viewed a few billion times. What do you not know a lot about? that if asked about, you don't really have that strong of an opinion or research on those topics? Physics. Really? Quantum physics. Okay. No, mathematics. Mathematics. No, I'm not, I'm not particularly smart mathematically. I've had students who were very gifted mathematically. Wow, piano, I would have thought me. you would have been a math guy because no. piano somewhat is a math uh, no, formula. No, my math intelligence is pretty average. So, I mean, there's lots of things I don't know much about. I don't know much about economics. Now, I'm not sure anyone knows much about economics, but they might. <laughs> but as a technical science, I certainly don't know much about it. So I've, there's plenty of, of room, there's plenty of places where I'm, you know, woefully ignorant. I don't know nearly as much about history as I should. It's quite embarrassing, really. Book a day and you don't know a lot about history. I think you're probably downplaying yourself. Here. Well, there's a lot to know. And, you know, I'm a, I know enough history to know what to have some sense of what I don't know, and man, it's a big, Fair it's a big expanse. Fair. I'd so, like to know a lot more. Why don't we talk about what you do talk a lot about, men. You talk a lot about, you know, what's going on right now with men. And for me, like, I'll ask this question maybe in a way that uh, uh, will get a different perspective for you. For me, I grew up with a father that taught a lot of the stuff you write in your book, The 12 Rules for Life. You know, stand up straight. My dad, people ask me, what has your dad told you the most? Never be afraid of the truth. If I tell you how many times, I don't even know how many times. He's probably told me that thing a million times. Never be afraid of the truth. Just say, it. never be afraid. And it's part of your, uh, one of the rules of life, rules for life. So. See, I think it's wrong. You should be afraid of the truth, but you should be more afraid of falsehood. See, and I mean, I mean that's no criticism of your dad's advice. But people are afraid of the truth because often if you reveal it, it causes conflict in the moment. All day long. Oh, yes, oh, certainly. All day long. Oh, but sometimes they don't even the want to know it. Oh, very often. Sometimes very. it's very scary yes. to even know about it. Yeah, otherwise it's trivial. But life is boring if we don't pursue that side. Right? I mean, what do you do if you go living not wanting to pursue the truth? To me, it's kind of like, what is the purpose if we're not at least trying to test our own beliefs to see if we are thinking right or not? If we're not thinking right, what the hell is the purpose of this life? Then we're just got eight years to be here and be gone, we may as well have a little bit of friction yes, well, to try telling, to figure it out. Yes, well, telling the truth is definitely an adventure. And so if you want an adventure, that's seeking a good one. Seeking the truth or telling the truth? Both. Okay. But, but, but seeking for sure, but also telling. You know, I what mean, do you mean look, by that, telling the well, truth look, is an adventure? Well, look, look, look. So, you know, one of the things that you're counseled to do, let's say, if you do a lot of media interviews, is to figure out what it is that you want to accomplish with the media interview. Okay. Right? So you have a goal. It's like, here's what I, would, I want to accomplish with this interview. And, uh, and p potentially there's some use in that. But another way of going about it is to just say what you think and see what happens. That's an adventure because you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So, look, there's this old idea that it's necessary to have faith in the truth. And so here's, here's a way of thinking about that. Someone asks you a question and you might think, well, here's the outcome I want. And so here's how I'm going to answer that question. So that's one way of approaching it. But another way of approaching it is 
you ask me a question, I'm going to think about the answer, and I'm just going to tell you what I think. And it doesn't matter what the outcome is, because I'm willing to see what the outcome will be, predicated on the idea that there isn't a better outcome than the one that truth produces. Even if it's harsh and terrible in the, in the short term, and sometimes it is, it's like there isn't a better way of doing it. Now, you might say, well, how do you know that? And the answer is, well, I don't know that. That's why it's an article of faith, because I believe, and, and, and I believe this deeply, the being that you produce as a consequence of telling the truth is good, by definition. But, so, but you're, you're, even though it's harsh and, and often uncomfortable, because you get in trouble. Yes, but your faith, to me, seems very mathematical. Like when I, when, I, when I see your answers about your faith, like you say, I choose to believe that there is a God, but I don't know. So it's a very logical answer you're given, right? I said act as if God exists. Act as if God right? exists. Which is a good definition of belief as yeah, far as sure. I'm concerned. Yeah, you know, believing in something you have not yet seen, right? You see the well, definition. Well, it's what you stake yourself on. Right. You know, like you think, well, how do you know if you believe something? Well, the answer is you stake your life on it. That's how you know, and, and that's something, I suppose, to the degree that I've been able to, I've staked my life on. It's like, well, do I believe it? Well, it depends on what you mean. I'm, I'm acting it out. I'm putting myself on the line. So that seems to be a reasonable definition of belief. You know, if someone says, you know, do you think there's a God in heaven? It's like, well, I don't know how to answer that question because I don't know exactly what you mean. That's what I'm saying. The logical part to me is more honest. I, I think the logical side of it is more of an honest way of looking at it, saying it's a bet. I don't know. You know, I'm not 100%, but I'm betting there is. If I was to bet to see if there is or there isn't, my bet is, yes, there is. That's the life I want to live, and I think I'm living a better life if I believe there is. Well, it's also, there's also, there's psychological elements that are associated with that, too, that are important. So one of the things I learned from Carl Jung, who, whom I have great respect for, is that we, we necessarily exist inside a hierarchy of values. And that manifests itself all the time, because in order to act, things have to come to a point. Right? For you to do something, you have to decide at that moment that that thing is more important to do than anything else that you're doing. And it isn't only how you act, it's even how you perceive. Because when you look at the world, you look at some things, one thing, rather than all the other things you could look at. So even to look at something, and this is technically true, you have to value the thing that you're looking at. Okay, so you're always using values to interact with the world, perceptually and in terms of action. Now, those values are organized. Otherwise, you're a chaotic mess. So they're organized. There's some consistency in what you do, right? There's a narrative driving it. That's another way of looking at it. it. Means you exist inside a value hierarchy. Some things are more important than others. Some of the things that are important to you are even more important than other things that are important. To other people. Yes. Well, to you, sure. to other yeah. people, period. Right. But you're pointing towards something. Now, you might be fragmented and pointing to a bunch of contradictory things, mm -hmm. but that's not helpful. Let's assume that you're a reasonably integrated person. Okay. And so you're, you're, pursuing, you're pursuing something of value. It's at the top of your hierarchy. Functionally speaking, whatever that is at the top of your hierarchy, that's God for you. And you might say, well, I don't believe in God. It's like, well, yeah, but you still have, you either something have- Something that's your God. You have an ultimate value sure. that performs the function that a deity would perform. I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that. Let me, let me ask this question. Do you think a lot of men today struggle with that? But maybe even not even men, men and women today, because, you know, there's a lot of different movements that you see. So it's almost like, uh, you know, there was a band back in the days and the night. They're still around. They perform in Vegas. They're called Boys to Men, right? We're going from boys to men. We are now men, and, you know, life has changed for us. I think we're going from men to boys at times today. You know, sometimes guys are feeling bad about being too manly. Like, you know, here's a man's man. Oh my gosh, he's a man's man. That's not how you're supposed to be. You don't have any empathy or feelings for other people. And then sometimes on the other side is, you know, you're not bossy enough. You're not this enough. Do you think there is a identity crisis right now for both men and women that they don't really know what position do I need to be to be a real man or a real woman? You think well, there's I some think of that going on? I think, let's start with the male part of that. I, so I think that right now our society is criticizing itself. There, that, that's part of, let's call it patriarchy theory, and the idea is the hierarchies that are characteristic of our society are male-dominated and predicated on power and tyranny. Okay, so I don't buy that. I think that any hierarchical structure can degenerate into tyranny, but I think that most of the hierarchical structures in the West are about as good as hierarchical structures ever get. And if you think we can do without hierarchical structures, then you don't know what you're talking about because you can't organize your perception without a hierarchical structure and you can't organize people in terms of pursuing a valuable goal. You can't even say that a goal is valuable without producing a hierarchy. 
So there's no getting rid of hierarchies. Now, then you can say, well, yeah, but the hierarchy is based on power and it's corrupt. And I don't think that's true in the West, although hierarchies can become corrupt. Okay, so let's say you do buy that, though. The hierarchy is patriarchal and it's corrupt. Well, then let's say you're a young man and you're ambitious. Well, then obviously you're corrupt, too, because your ambition is to take your place in the corrupt hierarchy. And so because the hierarchies aren't tyrannical and because they're based on competence, your ambition, if you have any sense, is actually to become competent. But if you confuse that with a power drive, and there's tremendous confusion about that, then you confuse young men because they think if they're ambitious and they want to get ahead, let's say, they want to be useful and competent, that they're somehow buying into the tyranny. So you actually punish the young men for their, for their virtues. And I actually think that that's part and parcel of this critical process. Because I think that one of the things that drives the people who are theorizing about the tyrannical patriarchy is that they absolutely detest competence. And it's a deep war. So it's very annoying. It's very hard on young men. But it's also hard on young women. So it's hard on young women because they end up with partners who are confused. They're confused about the relationship between masculine and feminine. They're confused about... To, to how, what role they should play out in the world. Apparently, it seems to be fine if a woman wants to play a patriarchal role. That seems to be perfectly fine ethically. I don't understand how that can be the case if the patriarchy itself is corrupt. It's corrupt, but it's okay if women occupy the positions of power. It's like, okay, how does that make sense? Well, none of this makes sense. Part of the reason it doesn't make sense is because it, it isn't designed to make sense. It's designed to be destructive. Now, there's more complications than that. There's lots of reasons why people are unstable in their roles now. And one of the big reasons is the introduction of the birth control pill. So we, we still haven't adapted to that by any stretch of the imagination. And we pro God knows how long it'll take. It's a huge biological transformation for women to have voluntary control over the reproductive function. That's a... You can't possibly overstate how massive a technological revolution that is. It's like a biological mutation. You know, it's like we're a different species. It's really a big deal. And so we're, the, there's plenty of waves produced by that, and we haven't sorted that out at all. Do you think that is becoming the norm that, you know, boys, like we had a, a guy today, Trent, asked the question, hey, I'd love to ask, you know, Dr. Peterson, I'm a new, new father today, raising kids today. How different is it to be a father today than before? Do you think he who controls the mic dictates how people should live and think, like men and women? And today the mic is controlled by media, and media is telling us everything, and it's controlled by 80% on, on one side. Do you think that's where the influence is coming from, and that's where the whole postmodernism's influence in the younger generation? Well, I think... It's hard to say. I mean, the criticisms that, that, that we've been discussing are in some sense justified because it's reasonable to look at a hierarchical structure and to be concerned about the degree to which it becomes tyrannical. Hierarchical structures tilt towards tyranny. You have to be awake and you have to be ethical in order to keep them straight. But the criticism has gone so far, as far as I'm concerned, that it's critiquing the entire idea. It's gone way down to the bottom and critiquing even the idea of the sovereign individual, which I think is a, is a catastrophic, mm -hmm. it's a catastrophic problem. And it's, it's so interesting to see the response to people after my talk, say, or as a consequence of watching my lectures, I have people come up to me every night, because I talk to about 150 people a night <clears throat> after the talks, and so many of them are happy because they've put their lives on firm foundation because they found a little bit of encouragement in my, in my lectures, saying, look, it's good for you to go take your place in the world. Have some ambition. Have, some, have a vision. Have a goal. Have a strategy. Try to, try to be a good person. In, in, not, not because it's your duty precisely, because that's the proper way to live. We're in danger of undermining all of that, and it's not good for people. One of the things that I've really learned, for example, recently is that there's a, or learned to articulate better, is that there's a very tight relationship between aspiration and responsibility. So let's say, well, the first question might be, do you need to aspire to something? And the answer is, well, yes, because you have to do something. You can't, if you just sit there, you'll die. You can't just sit there. You have to go act out in the sure. world. Okay, so act towards what? Well, that's whatever your aspiration is. You have to have an aim. Okay, well, what should the aim be? Well, it should be something worth doing, let's say. Why, why do something that you don't feel is worth doing? What do you think is worth doing? Well, if you watch other people and, and you judge when they're doing something worthwhile, you usually judge them positively if you see that they're taking responsibility, at least for themselves. What, do you want to be completely useless so other people have to take care of you? That's pretty pathetic. And maybe you could get your act together so you're taking care of yourself and your family. 
And maybe you could even do better than that and take care of yourself and your family and your community. Well, good for you. That's, that's responsibility and that's an aim. Well, here's one of the things that's cool about that is that your life doesn't have meaning without aspiration or an aim. Okay, so you need a hierarchy of values. There's got to be something at the top. It's got to be something important. If you don't have that, your life doesn't have any meaning. So if you criticize the hierarchy or even the ideas of, idea of hierarchy, you destroy the idea of aspiration and then people have nothing. Well, that's not helpful. People are built for a struggle and they're built for a weight and you want to take on a heavy burden voluntarily. See if you can put yourself together. See what you can do out in the world while you're waiting to die. It's an all-in game. It better be worthwhile. And so there's a tight relationship between responsibility and aspiration and hierarchy. And when you criticize those things, you get rid of the aspiration. But why are those ideas doing good today? Like, why, why are those, the idea of, you know, feeling entitled or victimhood mentality, why are those ideas doing good today? Why is it becoming a norm to say people are feeling like I'm a victim, but you don't understand what I'm going through, you don't understand where I'm at? It feels like there's a lot of that going on today versus, say, stand up and do something about your life and take some responsibility. Why are those ideas getting so much attention today? Or is it something that's always been like this? I think in some sense it's, it's, an, it's an eternal battle. I mean, the story of Cain and Abel is a story about that. It's about responsible, proper living and the jealousy that might be engendered while observing that. So it's a very, very old problem. I think, well, the problem is... Envy? Are you saying envy? Oh, en definitely envy, uh, yes, just, definitely uh, envy. I don't know well, if you... just think about discussion of the 1%. It's like, well, those evil 1%. Do you know how much money you have to make in order to be in the top 1% in, in worldwide terms? Oh, worldwide yeah, terms. Yeah, it's a lower well, number. Huh, we don't, we're not... $53,000 a year? It's $32,000. $32,000. We did a video on that. Yeah, $32,000 a year. If you make $32,000 yeah, a year, you're in the top, in the top 1%. 1%. Yes. So it's like, well, where, why do you draw the boundaries so that the top 1% are people that aren't you? If it's not envy, if you're doing okay, I mean, you're doing okay with, a, with a, say, a... Uh, an average working class salary. You're doing okay. I'm not yeah. saying you're doing great. You're not starving. You've got heat. You've got air conditioning. You've, you've got access to electronic technology. You've got some ability to move forward into the future. So you're doing all right. And by historical standards, you're doing damn fine. So why all of a sudden is the 1% that you're envious of only those people who are richer than you? when you're also part of the 1% worldwide, if that's not envy. So I know how, who the rich is. The rich is always someone who has more money than me. That's who the rich is. I don't put myself in that category, you know, especially if I'm pursuing this victim mentality. And then the other part of the victim mentality is, well, you know, let's say you can have a meaningful life by adopting responsibility, but it's a heavy load. You've got to be awake and alert and on your feet and moving towards something difficult. You have to have some self-control and you have to sacrifice in the present so that the future is better. It's complex. You have to integrate a lot. And when you take on some responsibility, your life has meaning. You think, I want a meaningful life. It's like, maybe you do if you're willing to take on the responsibility. What's the alternative? Well, to garner a lot of unearned sympathy for your victimization position and to, at the same time, take down the people who are willing to take more responsibility than you. It's a nasty game. And I see it played out in the universities too. I think if you quadrupled the salaries of sociologists, that most political correctness would go away. I think they're jealous and envious because they see people who aren't any smarter than them doing way better out there in the capitalist world. And that drives their envy and their hatred, even though they're unbelievably privileged in their positions as, let's say, sociology professors or social work professors or people who are on the faculties of education, all disciplines that have become incredibly corrupt. Envy. Those are two things right there then. Then we're talking media and we're talking about educational system. And the influence of the media and the educational system, 80% is on the left. Well, right? the media is a complicated, more complicated thing, I, I think, because I think what's happening in the mainstream media is that it's falling apart as a consequence of technological transformation. And as it's doing so, it's polarizing. You know, like, well, look, newspapers are having a hard time making sure. any money, right? We, we all know that. And of course, cable TV networks are losing all their viewers to things like YouTube, fault of people like you. And so they're starting to disintegrate. Well, when you start to disintegrate, you get more desperate. And when you get more desperate, well, then you have to attract attention however you can. And I think what we're seeing in the mainstream media is increasing focus on polarizing figures because that drives the remaining audience to view. And so I think a lot of that's being driven by the underlying technological transformations. So media solving for views rather than the truth is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how do you feel about the media yourself when you, when you think about the media? Well, I have mixed feelings about it. I mean, I've been treated very well by some journalists. 
you know, there's a handful of Canadian journalists in particular. I, I actually think they're the best journalists in Canada. And I don't, I hope that isn't mere personal bias who've taken a careful look at what I've been doing and saying and have been very supportive of me. The Post Media Group in Canada, it's an aggregation of 200 newspapers, came out publicly in support of my stance on free speech a year and a half ago. And at some cost to them because it was very contentious at that point. So that's been, that's been good. And of course, the media, so to speak, has also enabled me to bring what I know or purport to know to a very broad audience. And so that's, that's a very positive thing. I've had very, very stressful interactions with many, many journalists. It's certainly been the most stressful part of my life over the last two years. And some of it was absolutely reprehensible. Some of the journalists, MSNBC News, appalling, appalling and amateurish. So both at the same time, it's a bad combination. Um, Vice, another pit of snakes as far as I'm concerned. People who interviewed me and then chopped up the interview to make it look as bad as they possibly could. And that was all laid out by other people on YouTube who spliced back the original interviews and, you know, put out what I actually CNN. said. What do you think about I, CNN? Uh, CNN, I've had absolutely no contact with personally. Ever. I don't pay attention to them. Fox. Um, Fox, the Fox people have treated me very well. Look, I don't pay a lot. I, for, I, I ask watched. this question for one. Here's the reason why I'm asking this question for because so I'll sit with people and, and on the left and the right. We've had Gloria Allred, Jerry Springer, but we've had Prager, Shapiro, McAfee in the middle, Ron Paul. So you got two left, two right in the middle. Weird. I mean, we got them all right. Yep, we, yep. We, we, because I'm trying to get clear for myself philosophically and, and uh, politically to see if there's some clarity as an entrepreneur. What are some of the things we ought to pay attention to? Sometimes entrepreneurs. You're so independent, it's like, hey, listen, just leave me alone, don't bother me. For the most part, most entrepreneurs are libertarian-esque mm -hmm. type of philosophies, for the most part, because just let me get to work, I'm gonna make my money, I'm gonna create jobs. I don't wanna get anybody else into my business. Having said that, I hear Republicans complain about the fact that, well, you know, 80% of media is controlled by the left, you know, and look what they own, they own New York Times, they own Washington Post, they own, you know, they own this and they own that and they own this and look what they just did to Alex Jones, they just banned them, a hundred different websites banned them, PayPal just banned them, what's this guy gonna do? Why can't he get up there and go out there and say what's on his mind and it's all the liberal media's fault, right? I hear that. Then on the complete opposite side, I say, wait a minute, Time Magazine was just bought by the founder of Salesforce.com for $350 million. You mean to tell me somebody on the right couldn't have bought Time Magazine for $350 million? How much influence does it have? So when I hear that part on the conservative side, the right side, Republicans calling the left snowflakes, I see the other side that sometimes conservatives, Republicans, if you're calling them snowflakes, why don't you go also and compete and buy some media and create some media for yourself? There aren't any social media platforms that are pretty much owned by somebody on the right or conservative. So that's why I asked the question from you saying, you know, what do you think about media? Is it majority controlled on the other side? And why aren't the Republicans or the people on the right doing something about it? We're at least 50-50, media is 50-50, where I can get up and say, you know what? I agree, I disagree, they're full of it, these guys are full of it, but I have an opinion, mm -hmm. versus 80% tells me to go look one side. I think part of it, the argument that the large scale social media providers were politically biased in some important sense has only existed for about three or four years in any real sense, right? It's really expanded, I would say, since the election That's of Trump. That's by le the left? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't think people necessarily thought five years ago that Facebook and Google were primarily left, at least to the degree that they're accused of as being now. Well, Silicon Valley, for the most yes, part, outside true. of Peter Thiel would be left. If you yeah. think about Silicon Valley, the only person that you got to be worried about is right, but how Thiel. long? How long has that really been a contentious issue? Like Google has only been a, a company that people had had mixed opinions about for about two years. Like people were pretty happy well, about let's, Google. Let, let's say a handful of years. Yeah, okay, but nothing, okay. nothing to the point well, where it's so, out right now. I agree with okay, you. Okay, so, so well, I think part. But if you think about CNN, you know, MSNBC, Washington Times, New York Times, yeah, some of that is is purely that's true. Sure, but to some degree that was balanced by Fox News. I think part of the reason that there One aren't... One channel against well, I know. the rest of them. Well, look, yeah. fair enough, but to some degree it yeah. was balanced. I think part of the reason that there aren't more conservative social media platforms is because it wasn't obvious until relatively recently that that was a necessity. Now, but I, I still think your point is well taken. If the conservatives want to do something about um, the, the hypothetically liberal bias of the large-scale social media companies, then they're free to go out and do something about it. But I don't think they've, I don't think they've considered that a problem for... For that many years, you don't years think they yet. have. You don't think they've seen that as a problem. Well, for I how see long them do you think? 
I mean, I, I've been following American politics, say for, uh, I mean, I come from Iran. So for us, we know Jimmy Carter, the influence played in Iran, and my mom's family's communist, dad's side's imperialist. I lived in Germany, two years refugee camp. So I've had to follow politics yeah. for quite some time because it's affected my life, right? And when, when you see politics here, I would say 20 years of me at least looking at it. I think a lot of it's been on the left. But the, part, the reason why I'm asking this is I'm not looking for it being right. I, I don't think it's good to be 80% either side. Like, I think what you, Shapiro, Rubin, uh, uh, Rogan, some of us, what we do on Value Time when we talk about capitalism, I think that is very healthy. But I'll, I also think John Oliver is good. I also think John Stewart is good. I think some of that is also good because we need both sides to well, say. Well, and it's certainly the case that the people that you just described aren't having any shortage of opportunity to get their message not, out over. They're not. I mean, I mean. But the control at the top. That's the thing when I say control at the top. There's where, distrust at the top, too. Yeah, you but, know, like Ruben tweeted out yesterday. He said that he's got reports from hundreds of people that, that have been uh, unsubscribed from his channel. You know, and the problem is, well, is that true or is it not true? The problem is, is that, well, the trust for YouTube, for example, has been damaged. You know, and Google shut me down. They shut my YouTube channel down. They shut my, my email channels down, all of them one day. Everything. I had thousands and thousands of emails on Gmail. Everything for the last 15 shut years. Down. Completely. I couldn't get access at all. I couldn't get access so to my calendar. So what do you think about that? Oh, what? I was appalled. It was absolutely horrible. Does it, it, does it not concern you a little bit? Of course it concerns me. So I switched to DuckDuckGo yesterday. Did you really? A, yeah, well, I'm Seriously. starting to play with it. Yes. And you said you're going to get off to, you were well, thinking about getting off of Twitter. I don't think it's a good idea, but you said that, you were that considering. That I should be on it or should no, be No, you're it. saying I'm thinking about no longer going on yeah. Twitter and kind of writing more articles on my, because your son recommended that use you write more. Well, and there's other, like I could use Reddit more, for example. I don't use Reddit much and. I already have a good You're YouTube deep. following. I, th I think you writing, you, 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 when you write, and I, I read the article, obviously, when you wrote on your website, said, I shouldn't have just said this on Twitter. Yes. Let me elaborate. And yes. when I read it, you know, and then you said to yourself, look, it's just because I say something doesn't mean I'm right. I was thinking it. Not every thought I'm saying means I'm right, but I was thinking about that, right? So, but when you go deeper into it, I see that part. I said, wow, this is interesting how he's wired. No, my, my only concern is the fact that, look, in Iran, the Shah was worried about today. Today was a group of communists in Iran. And everything they wanted to do is find him and trying to get rid of him, right? I was, oh my gosh, we can't have these concepts coming. And then people were so afraid of today that they were forgot about Khomeini. Oh, Khomeini's in you know, France. They never have to worry about it. He came in and then boom. So the fear of communism, of what if they could take over, made him kind of give more ability for Khomeini to create influence that led to a revolution when 9 million people in the streets of Iran revolt and boom, Iran goes from one day, one of the best countries in the Middle East coming up and the Middle East was safe. Next thing you know, the war, half a million people getting killed and all this other stuff. So I think sometimes being worried about what other people are going to say that you disagree with, I don't think it leads to good things. But today, 100 social media platforms are controlled on one side. That's a scary thought, mm -hmm. Jordan. Mm -hmm. If all of a sudden capitalism becomes a curse word and anybody uses capitalism, hey, you know. I actually see things in the U.S. balanced quite nicely. You know, I mean, there is tremendous control on the, say, left-leaning end of things in academia and in, in the classic mainstream media. But, you know, the, the electoral process seems to have balanced that out quite nicely because the Republicans have... I agree. Yeah, so I agree like, with I, you. the American system seems to work pretty damn well. I agree with you, absolutely. It'll be really interesting to see what happens in November's elections. American so, system works well. However, this is the one part that I think we have to realize that, uh, you know, Ron Paul started social media influence on politics. Ron Paul raised, I think, $6 million in 2004 on MySpace in 24 hours. In 24 hours, he raised six million. Everybody's like, Obama's like, what? This guy raised six million dollars in 24 hours on my, and he's how old? I'm, I'm young, I'm cool, I'm handsome. I'm gonna raise billions. And then he took social media and he raised, and he's a two-term president, and then Trump, you take uh, Jack Dorsey's Twitter out, I don't know if Trump's president today. Mm -hmm. So Trump learned how to use Twitter to his advantage. Now that everybody knows the power of social media, the concern now becomes, Everyone knows what you need to do if you want to be a president two years from now or six years from now, right? You know if you play the game of social media, whoever's got the big following. So now the people at the top who control these social media platforms are more powerful than some governments are. So this is why when you say the electoral college, you know, the system works, it works today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that doesn't yeah, well, necessarily we have no, mean. Well, we have no idea how 
all this technological transformation will, will destabilize and transform things going into the future. That's what I'm saying. I mean, saying. part of the reason yeah. that I'm going on this tour, for example, and talking to people about individual responsibility is that I see this, like everyone does, this unbelievably rapid process of technological transformation approaching us. I think, well, we better be wise enough to handle it because we can't predict it, right? So to the degree that we have character flaws that could be rectified, the, the consequences of those are going to be magnified by our increased technological power. So I'm hoping that everybody can try to get their act together a little bit more carefully. And, and that's, that's also been extraordinarily fun. In this, like the, the lecture, so I've been in 85 cities since March. That's amazing. And, and yeah, since it is, it's been... It's, it's been, unbelievable. Been, yes, and I've been fortunate because I've had lots of good people helping me make sure this works, and it has worked so far, but it's really quite... It's very heartening because all these, every night I talk to about 2,000 people, not every night, but like four nights, out of, four nights in a week. As far as I can tell, they're all primarily coming there because they want to put their house together from a psychological perspective. They're interested in developing a vision for their life and taking on responsibility. And I have dozens of people every night who, who have told me that over the last couple of years, their lives have been transformed. They've gone from a bad place you know, where they were really lost and nihilistic. They've decided that they were going to do something with their life. You know, I, had, I tweeted out something today. That some kid, kid wrote me, he said, two years ago, he didn't have any friends. He didn't, he didn't have an intimate relationship. He didn't know where he was going in his life. He didn't have a job. Like, he was just, you know, nothing was going for him. And he's doing a philosophy degree. He's in his second year. He has a good job. He's got a girlfriend. He's got friends that care for him. It's like he's put his life right wow. together. And so I hear this sort of story from people all the time. People stop me on the street and tell me this, which is lovely, right? To go to a city you've never been to. This happens to me all the time. I'll be walking down the street. Someone will come up and say, um, I'm sorry that I'm bothering you. And they're not because people are very polite. They've been very polite to me. They say, you know, I wasn't in such a good place a year ago, two years ago. I've been trying to put my life together. I've been listening to your lectures. And here's a bunch of things that are way better for me. It's like, right on, man. The more of that, the better. And I think that's the right way forward, you know, this, which is why I don't really regard myself as a political person. I have political interests, but mostly I'm a, I, operate, I try to operate at the level of psychology. It's like better for people to put their lives together. It's important, and I think each person is crucially important. I think that's a predicate of, of, of the democratic state, right? We wouldn't let people vote. People wouldn't have the responsibility to vote to determine the outcome of the state if there wasn't a deep belief in our culture that each person was vital. And I do believe that. I believe that the world is constructed so that each person plays a vital role. And so every time that someone gets their act together, it's like, great, great. That's going to have way more positive effect than you think. And stave off an awful lot of trouble. Because someone who goes bad can do an unbelievable amount of damage. So even just not yeah. going bad is a good thing. So you know sometimes you, you read these uh, you know, articles or videos, uh, America's more divided than it's ever been before. And then you read some research and it says, you know, it's actually not the truth. America's more united than we've ever been before. It's a better place than it's ever been before. I know you're a Canadian looking in, but you're going also speaking everywhere. 85 places you speak since March. That's a lot of people you're shaking hands with that you're yeah. talking to. And the 150 people that stick around afterwards, they have having a dialogue. This is more info you have here than the average human being. Mm -hmm. What are you feeling about the conditions of America? Are we more divided than we've ever been before, or are we well, actually... We're, we're definitely not more divided than okay. we've ever been before, because, I mean, you guys had a civil war. And we're certainly not at that point. And I don't think that the current division is any greater than it was in the 1960s. In fact, I think it's less. I think there, there's more, there was more tension while in the, the 60s, war was going on. Well, yeah. yes, there was a war. Sure. I mean, that makes a big difference, right. you know. I mean, people, people, young people particularly now who haven't been through that don't re realize what that's like. It's not like I've been through that personally, but a war is a big deal and a universal draft. I mean, that was high stakes bargaining, you know, and then things were pretty divided later uh, under Nixon. That was the mm -hmm. end of the 60s. Mm -hmm. And then they were divided again under Reagan. There were huge scale protests under Reagan and the Cold War had really heated up and everyone was afraid that we were going to push the nuclear button. And so there was plenty of division then. Even in, in my lifetime, I've seen times when I think that your country, the United States, was more divided than it is now. There is a fair bit of polarization now. I know that if you look at how what's happened to political attitudes, the, the typical Democrat has moved farther to the left over the last 20 years. The Republicans haven't moved that much. They're still relatively, the median Republican is still relatively close to the center. But I think a lot of the polarization is actually being driven by the death of the mainstream media. 
Like, you know, you always want to look at what the consequence of a technological transformation is. And this is a big transformation. You know, there used to be flagship media sources that were basically attempting to give a balanced picture, and I think they did a pretty good job 30 years ago, Time magazine, even the mainstream news programs, they, 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 they had a professionalism that was associated with their journalism that had some degree of objectivity, and that's fragmented. And, and it's fragmenting because there's all these media sources, like mm. innumerable media sources. And so it's, it's driving people who are trying to get attention to desperation, and they, they exaggerate the polarity. And so that puts everyone on edge, and Twitter puts people on edge. Like, and this is part of the reason I'd thought about, I'm still thinking about what to do with Twitter. Maybe I should not use it for a month, because Twitter, I think, my experience with Twitter is that I'm wandering around in the world and everything's fine. The streets are peaceful. The people I meet are, every, the people I meet are doing well. That your cities I've been to, I don't know how many American cities in the last four months, like 40 or 50, they look great. You know, I mean, the, everywhere I go, there's construction and, and the, the country feels like it's moving. How does one person that's watching the news, and that's where the news they get from, they, they consume news through m m media. I'm watching CNN, Fox, MSNBC, whatever. Yeah. How do I tell a part between the truth and propaganda? Well, I don't know. I mean, when I counsel my clinical clients who are depressed or anxious, one of the things I've always told them to do over the last few decades is to disconnect themselves from the news. This was before the social media. And you still believe that today? Well, I hadn't, see, you asked me about CNN earlier. Like, I haven't watched mainstream television news since like 1985. You gotta be kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Let me get this straight. I wanna hear you say this one more time. You haven't watched mainstream media since 1985? No, very little. I didn't have a TV. I didn't have a TV since 19, about 1985. When's the last time you watched CNN? Probably in an airport for a few minutes. I virtually never watched CNN. So if I come, come to your place, I know you have some interesting collection of art that yeah. you collect, but if I come to your place, your TV's not going to be on CNN. There's no TV. There's no TV in your I house. I haven't had a TV since 1985. I realized back in 1985 that news wasn't news. If it, if it was only news for a day, it wasn't important. So I read magazines, you know, I've read, I read Harper's, or I'm not at the moment, Harper's Atlantic Monthly, uh, The Economist, those were my, my basic sources wow. for news. Now that's changed, you see, because I got tangled up so badly in scandal two years ago that I've been on top of, especially social media, like an obsessed addict for two years trying to manage it. You know, but it's not clear to me that that's been a good thing for, like, well, I've, I've got to... For your sanity or well, for... it's, it's, certainly, I don't think Twitter is a good thing for my sanity. Twitter is so contentious. It's so, I mean, if you want a daily dose of hate, you can get it in 10 minutes on Twitter. You know, if I post something, you know, there's, <laughs> there's, uh, there's a number of comments about whatever I posted, and one out of four of them is brutally rude and obnoxious as nasty as it can possibly be. And that's very, very common. And like, you know, people are quite sensitive to negative information. We're more sensitive to negative information than we are to positive information. And, and so, and I'm not complaining. I don't have to use Twitter. It's a completely voluntary choice. And I'm certainly a massive beneficiary of the existence of social media. So I'm not complaining about it. Mm -hmm. I don't have a right to complain about it. But it exists in absolute contrast to my experiences in the world. Like, it's not like I'm walking down the street and one person out of four jumps out of an alley and like curses me. I haven't had a single negative interaction with an individual. That's not true. I met one really drunk woman in, in, um, in Dublin and she called me a wanker. <laughs> but she was quite the piece of work though. Was with it a after, little timid husband by her side. Was it after Connor lost? Maybe she was pissed off because <laughs> maybe, the Maybe UFC she was. Yeah. But, but I've had thousands of interactions with individual people on the street, let's say, in airports and so forth, in the last six months, and every single one of them has been overwhelmingly wow. positive. Uh, so that's reality. Then I go into Twitter and it's like, oh my God, it's just brutal, brutal. Does it really bother you though? Do you really get uh, bothered? And listen, uh, all of us, you know, no one likes negative comments. Like right before this, Mario's sitting, I'm preparing my notes, and Mario's like, look at the three negative comments we got today. I'm like, Mario, I'm doing an interview. You're yeah. sitting here telling me, so obviously before doing some like this, but does it, does it bother you a little bit when you read those negative oh, comments? Oh, definitely. Really? Oh, definitely. Well, look, when, 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 I, was, when I was still working as a professor, I'm, I'm on unpaid leave at the moment, um, you know, I get my, my feedback from my students, and my feedback has been generally extraordinarily positive. 
So maybe there'll be 50 comments from students right. and three of them will be negative, something like that, or two. And, and often quite nasty, the negative ones. And uh, you remember the negative ones. And th that is what people are like. We're much more sensitive to negative. And that, the reason for that is negative things can kill you. Positive things can make you a little happier. So going back to it, I guess what you are saying is with the uh, social media platform, you saying from 1985, you didn't consume any content on TV outside of pure accident, there is no TV at your house. In the last two years, you've done it because social media, so you kind of have to be aware. Yeah, I had to be on top of it. Has, okay, so this is an interesting question. Are you happier now that you're consuming the content last two years, or do you find yourself being, man, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more anxious than I was two years ago. I was a little oh, bit more Oh, I'm peaceful. way more anxious. Really? Than I, oh, yes, So are you thinking more. about going on a diet again from social media? Like, Well, no, not a, not a, look, it's, it's, it's complicated because my life has gone, I mean, my life was fairly, broad two years ago i had a number of businesses i had my clinical practice i was working as a professor i was writing i was involved in lots of things and so i had plenty to do you know but since then it's gone like this and some of it's unbelievably good and some of it's really really bad and so the breadth of it has extended and so like I, there's no shortage of ridiculously positive things that are happening to me on an ongoing basis. I can't even believe it. But the same is true on the negative end. And so what's happened is the, the range of my emotional experience has expanded almost unbearably, I would say. So, and again, I'm not complaining about that because yep. I could choose to do it differently. But some of this has also been a matter of management. It's like, it is, it is literally the case that, although it's been a little better over the last three or four months for about, 18 months in a row, I was at the center of a scandal that could have taken me out at least twice a week. So constant, non-stop scandal of one form or another. And so th that took a lot of juggling and management to see what was going on. And I was paying attention to social media and trying to um, figure out how to respond in the press and on YouTube and, and on my blog and all of these sorts of things, trying to learn how to do that. And so it's been an, obs an obsessive learning uh, experience, let's say. Um, I, YouTube has served me very, very well. My blog works out very well for me. Um, the podcast, I have a podcast, it's very popular. That's worked out really well. Facebook, I don't pay much attention to Facebook, although I post on it. Twitter, that's, that's something else. Twitter is, Vicious, I don't know huh? what to do with Twitter. I, I'm, I don't know what to do with Twitter. I, I, I think, I go back and forth. I, I go back and forth. You know, there's a part of me that there's people I keep up with on Twitter, the people I follow, some of these IDW types, so to speak. You know, I see what Shapiro's posting. I see what Brett Weinstein's posting and Sam Harris. And mm -hmm. I kind of keep in the mm -hmm. loop that way. And I feel a moral obligation to be, to keep up. And I have 900,000 followers and I feel an obligation to them too. But there's this also this addictive curiosity, you know, that, 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 What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? And I, I tried to pull myself away from that on the TV news because it's the same thing except in much less concentrated form. And it was good for me. And I do think if it's only important today, it's not important. Right? If it's news, it doesn't matter if you don't know about it for a week. That's powerful. It's still news. But I still haven't figured out how to completely deal with all this social reach I have at my fingertips. I don't know exactly how to manage it. You feel there's an addiction to it? Because you know that's the whole thing with social media addiction to feel like you are committed to seeing what everybody else is doing because it's a part of loyalty. Like, I got to be loyal to them and I kind of feel like they've been loyal to me. Yeah. You feel there's some of that going on? Oh, there's definitely some of that. That's but there's also, yeah. there's also that, it, there's also an, uh, uh, like, I am insatiably curious about things. And yeah. so Twitter is terrible for that because it's just <laughs> continual hits of, of information. So I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, if you're talking reading a book a day and you all of a sudden have all this information to your hands, like, what is this? What's going on over here? What about this? Oh my gosh, what's it? So you can get really caught up with that. Yes. And, and that's starting to happen a lot with social media. Last question here before we go into speed round. Educational system. You're a professor. I mean, you've been in the environment. You see what's going on. I know sometimes when we're talking about early 80% of media is on the left, one of the stats you read about is that uh, one in 12 professors in colleges today are conservative. Mm -hmm. One in 12. Mm -hmm. That means 11 are not, right? Mm -hmm. So... You know, what do you think is the influence of colleges and how do you feel about the current educational system, period? I've seen large institutions fall apart because they make a fatal error. I think universities are making seven fatal errors. Top heavy administration that keeps growing, 
okay? Increase in the number of part-time untenured faculty members who have no administrative or, or academic power. Okay. Massively increasing. Insane increases in tuition combined with indentured servitude for students, right? You get a student loan, you can't declare bankruptcy. Now, so that means that the burgeoning administration has learned how to pick the pockets of the young people's future earnings. They entice them into university and offer them extended adolescence with no responsibility, and the price they garner from them is, is to garnish their future earnings. Crooked game. Ethics committees. Absolute catastrophe. The, the, the dominance of this, post, this weird, nonsensical alliance between the postmodern types and the neo-Marxist types, which makes no sense philosophically given the postmodernist stated, um, what would you call it, skepticism for meta-narratives, why the hell they've aligned themselves with the Marxists is beyond me, except that I think postmodernism is just a shell game for, for Marxism. That's another fatal error. The gerrymandering of the grade system. So that's, I think I got six there. All of those, they're, they're not good. They're, they're fatal, I think, all of them. And so I think that, I don't know what's going to happen to the university system over the next 20 years, but I'm certainly not optimistic about it. So, and I've hired some people. This is like, this is a big problem we yeah, just discussed, and I've got this little solution. And so I know I'm talking about a little solution. That'd be an interesting book if you were to write about it. Well, that, I've, that'd be I've, an interesting I've hired thing if you some people. It. I've hired some people to build an online education platform, and we're, they've been working on it for six months, and we have a bit of a prototype, and we're trying to figure out how to build an alternative. You know, you said, look, if, if the conservatives are so concerned about the liberal media, why the hell don't they go out and build their own media empire? It's like, well, if I'm concerned about the education right. system, then why don't I try to generate an alternative to it? You're doing it. Yeah, I'm trying to. Right. I mean, the probability that it will succeed is like zero because sure. it's an impossible task. But we're trying to build a platform that would help people use their online time more productively and keep track of it. So imagine that everything that you taught yourself on YouTube could be accredited and you could be you could be rewarded for that across time and maybe guided through it so that you could you could track your educational progress through along a whole wide range of potential learning mm -hmm. opportunities we'd like to build an online portal that would make your use of your online time much more productive and engaging that so that's that's what we're aiming coming at coming soon oh god who knows we have a prototype we have a prototype, and we've applied to Y Combinator. I don't know if we'll get accepted. Maybe we will, and maybe we won't. We've got all alternatives lined up. If well, we're let not us accepted. know about it. We have I some will, context. We would love to know more about it. I will, we may I will let you know. With the right yep. people. Uh, what's next for you, by the way? I mean, what are your aspirations? I mean, you know, everybody has inspirations that you're talking about, right? Everybody. Well, I can tell you what's happening in the next year, but that's as far out as I can look. Term. Oh, so you no, don't, know. don't know? Things so are prime way too minister, much in Prime minister, politics, flux. nothing no, like that. I, so no, we're never going to see Prime Minister Jordan Peterson. That's not. That's not in the equation. Um, not that I can foresee at the moment. I mean, God only knows because I can't look that far out. I'm more interested in what I'm doing at the moment. I think it's more useful. I can tell you what I'm doing for the next year. Okay, so next month I'm going to Europe. I have, I have like 15 talks in Europe all over the place. And then Hawaii, Los Angeles, Calgary, Vancouver, more talks. And then Florida. And then I'm going to Australia and New Zealand in February for, a, for another lecture tour. If the Y Combinator thing pops up, I'll go to San Francisco for January and February. In March, I'm going back to Europe. I'll probably hit another 25 cities then. From May to September, I'm going to hopefully finish up my next book, which is called 12 Moral, More Rules for Life, Beyond Mere Order. That's the plan. And then from September to December next year, I'm going to, I did a, a whole series of lectures on Genesis. I want to go back after that, but go to Exodus and do a series of lectures on Exodus. So that's out for the next year. And after that, I don't know. I have no idea. That's plenty of planning for, that's for plenty how, of planning next well, for months. how fluid and crazy things are right now. That's, that, <clears throat> if I get through all that, that'll be a miracle. I, I think if you were to start a university or online university or somewhere to educate thinking, processing, decision-making process, I think that would that would that wouldn't just be something that'll do well in the states here. That'll be worldwide. On well, how we that we, could we also want to build modules. We've been trying to figure out how to do this: is to teach people to read, to teach them to think, to teach them to speak and present, to teach them to negotiate. So part it's very of very aligned be, with what we're thinking. It's so weird, like the stuff he's saying. Yeah, well, there's a there's a crying need for yeah. it, and, and obviously, with the current technology that we possess, it would be possible to educate everyone. Hypothetically, and we'd also like to do it at low cost. So one of our goals is to, is to make a high quality university equivalent education 
process that would be like one one tenth to one one hundredth of the current cost. That's powerful. That and we have a need for that. So the fact that you're doing that, I'm looking forward to it. I think I think the way, you know, your uh, uh, you, your your ideas have been growing and people are looking at it and being so receptive. Where nowadays everybody's talking Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson. Well, maybe one day if the man upstairs has uh, plans, who knows? Maybe. Uh, you know, uh, the Trudeau last name may be replaced by Peterson last name, you know, in a, in a place like Canada. But we'll see what happened there. Definitely you are very presidential, prime minister-esque type of a person. And uh, you're, you're good with fashion as well. You know how to put it together. So you're very fashionable. Anyway, so let's do a speed round. Let's okay. do a speed round. Okay. I'll say some things. Okay. A name of a person. Just tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Right. Okay, whatever it may be. All right. Drake. Male duck. Male <laughs> duck. Okay. <laughs> Kanye West. King of the IDW. That's Dave Rubin's joke. Really? Okay, mm. Trump. Anomaly. Trudeau, Justin Trudeau. Um, that, I just shake my head at that. Okay. Oh, v man who capitalized without virtue on the name of his father. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes, wow is right. Wow. If he had an ounce of character, he would have never run. I'm not happy about him. Un he had no right. Well, he had a right. He's a citizen. He can run. He didn't earn his name. Not impressed. Why do you say that? Is this specific? Because or? his father was very famous. Sure. And so that put Trudeau at a tremendous advantage with regards to moving into a leadership position in Canada. It's not excusable. You should move ahead on your own merits, especially if you're daring to do something like run a country. You have a moral duty. If you have the advantage of a name, you have a moral duty to supersede the accomplishments of the person who bore that name and gave it its weight before you dare capitalize on it in the public sphere. And there's, Trudeau did none of that. He, can, he knows how to behave, he knows how to act in public. He had the upbringing for it. Other than that, there's nothing there, not that I can see. And if there was, he wouldn't have run the way he did. He's not, not an impressive person in my estimation. Some strong opinions there, strong yeah, well, there. He appointed 50% of females to 50% of his cabinet because it was, what do you say? It's, well, because it's 2015, it's like, no. Quarter of your elected members of parliament were female. If you would, your job was to pick the most qualified people, period, regardless of their genitalia, because they're leading the country. You pick the most qualified people. Instead, he abdicated his responsibility to make those difficult decisions and then wallpapered it over with a, this casual virtue of, well, I'm going to promote women. It's like, no, you're going to promote competent people, you weasel. No excuse for it. Wow. I'd say one word, but that was a few hundred yeah, words. Yeah, well. And we'll take it. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Okay, how about vegans? To each his own, man. <laughs> to each his own. Okay, fair enough. Jim Jeffries. He's a comedian. You know, okay. more power to him. I like comedians. Kathy Newman. Failure to learn from experience. Alex Jones. Don't persecute someone who's paranoid. It's a big mistake, strategically speaking. You know, lots of people think conspiratorially. It's a, it's a mode of thinking. Mm -hmm. And perhaps Alex Jones a little more than everyone else. They didn't just stop Alex Jones. They stopped all the people that were listening to him. All those people weren't stupid. It wasn't like they believed everything Alex Jones said. She left him the hell alone. So it's not, he's a canary in the coal mine, I think. Karl Marx. A testament to the murderous power of resentment. Elon yeah. Musk. Amazing. He's amazing. He's done five impossible things. <laughs> That's amazing. It's a, absolutely beyond belief. Yeah. It's hard to believe he exists. Uh, he made an electric car and then he shot it into space. Right. Either one of those things is really hard, <laughs> but to do them together and to yes. actually do them, it doesn't even seem real. And he lives during our times. Yeah. That's what's, yeah, you know, we amazing. talk about Einstein, but we, yeah. he's current. So, look, so here's what I want to do, if you don't mind. I want to get a signed copy of one of your books. Yep. And we give it away to one of the value tainers. Since everybody's been asking about, you know, uh, uh, Jordan Peterson being on here on Value Tainer, Dr. Jordan Peterson, I figure we get a signed book out. Uh, you know, you have a self-authoring website yep. where you teach people how to write books. Why don't yep. you talk a little bit about well, that? Well, it's a program. That it's an online writing program that helps people straighten out their past, write an autobiography, okay. understand their personality, virtues, and faults, and to develop a vision and a strategy for the future. It's a really useful program. The future authoring part, which is the part that helps you develop a vision, if university students do that, it increases the probability they'll, they'll stay in university by about 
And we've done that with thousands of people. And so if you're trying to get your act together, this is an excellent way to sit down and have a discussion with yourself about what's important, where you've been so in your life and what's I'm important. So questions I'm asking myself. Yep. Wow. It, it breaks okay. down the process of planning your life. And I'm really curious because yep. the way you were explaining it earlier. So uh, this program is 29 bucks. you said earlier. Yeah, that's right. And you get all three programs and okay. you get an extra one for a friend. How about we get so, a code yep. that we put on there that they can P get a, Let's use PBD. PBD They can get a 20% discount. Okay, so here's yep. what we're going to do. This is what I want you to do. Go to selfauthoring.com, yep. sign up for the program, $29.95. There'll be a 20% discount if you use the code PBD. Then when you buy this program, tweet me and him with the handles that we have right next to our names. You should see it. It's right next to our names. And you and I will pick a winner and we'll send, send a signed copy to one of the people that we pick as a winner. How about yep, that? That'd be good. Sounds like a good deal? That'd be good. Hey, yep. uh, uh, thanks so much for hey, coming. thanks for Really the enjoyed it. Yep. Really, really enjoyed it. Yep. Looking forward to next time. Yep. Bye, Tainers. Take care, everybody. Much love. Bye-bye. <laughs>